the blessing of supply chain, again, because they're like an, an internal consultant, is that we are not so far into the fire that we can't see how to contain it and how to control it. Without supplies, there's no surgery. Without products, there's no patient care. Welcome to Power Supply, the healthcare supply chain podcast focused on helping you navigate the intricacies of logistics, purchasing, contracting, and supplier relationships. Each episode, we speak with healthcare executives, supply chain leaders, and innovative entrepreneurs from across the country as they share their stories, experience, and expertise on the industry we love. From the loading dock to strategic sourcing, from buyers to the C-suite and across the enterprise, we tackle the real-life issues impacting the healthcare supply chain. Whether you're tuning in for conversation or inspiration, we're glad you're here. You're just in time to hear it from the source and stock up on insight. So sit back and plug into Power Supply. On this episode, we are speaking with Catherine Williams, supply chain expert in Hayes. We're going to be talking about getting involved in contract labor spend, getting that transparency, making yourself a resource to the clinicians that are really struggling with this today out there in the industry. And we titled it, Do Yourself a Favor, Get Involved in Contract Labor Spend. Kat's going to tell us why you should today. Absolutely. And she makes some really good cases for doing it. And obviously, it's been a massive issue the last, you know, two, three years, obviously. But she has a really good insight in spite of the fact that Kat is an uh, Arkansas Razorback fan. Otherwise, she's really good at what she does. So come and listen. All right. We're going to be right back. Stay with us. Catherine Williams up next. I'm Hayes Walder. This is Gary Skinner. And I'm Justin Poulin. A production of 17 Studios. You're listening to Power Supply. We are speaking with Catherine Williams, supply chain expert today on Power Supply. And Kat, really excited to have you on the show. You did a nice job of promoting the recording here as we were leading up to this, although it's probably going to be a little while before the episode releases. We are equally as excited to talk to you today, especially because this is a topic that we have not covered on a prior episode. And I think there's also some acknowledgement here that's going to be happening about labor spend and the fact that supply chain is already managing it. You're going to tell us exactly how and why you need to do yourself a favor, as we've titled this episode, and get involved in contract labor spend. So, Kat, thanks so much for coming on the show. Yeah, absolutely. I am super stoked to be here and talk with you guys, and hopefully I won't go off the rails and make it a whole hour long. But yeah, I am ready to spread the good word about supply chain. Well, Kat, we're excited to have you here. And unfortunately, all of our millions of listeners are not able to see what we see <laughs> as when we record this. I'm looking at your office here, and there's a flag or a banner there. It's red. What does that banner say, first of all? It is my University of Arkansas Razorbacks alumni banner. I went to school up on the hill, and I'm sure you're about to bless us with some very complimentary things about the Razorbacks. I was just going to say, it was nice having you on here today. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I'm a, I'm a year, University of Tennessee fan, so we have Rocky Top. But what, what do y'all do? What do y'all say down there in, in Razorback country? We say, woo, pig stewie. <laughs> and then we go oh, I love it. I <laughs> we love it. This. We weren't expecting that today, were we? All right. Because you did that, we're going to allow you to stay on. But thanks so much for sharing that with us. <laughs> Kat, why don't you talk about, I don't know how to transition out of that. I feel like that's the close. <laughs> right. Well, baby, let's we go. Just, Hayes just got what he needed. Drop the mic. I'm um, done. <laughs> I, was wait, I was hoping I could get you to do that. So, Kat, we know a little bit about your educational background, but why don't you talk to us about your supply chain background? 
Sure, sure. So I have 15 years of what I like to call full cycle healthcare supply chain background. So that is everything from sourcing, contracting, value analysis, operations, strategy, and leadership. So seen it all, done most of it, and have loved every second of it. One of the things that you said to me when we got introduced was that you felt like supply chain was already a team of internal consultants available throughout the healthcare organization and yet continued to be underutilized. Can you put that into context for the audience yeah. before we talk about contract labor spend? Sure. So in, in the hospital setting, when folks think about supply chain, there's still this kind of leftover historic adversarial relationship between supply chain and clinicians, right? So we're the folks that always say no, or we're the folks that change out their favorite product because we're going to save some nominal amount of money or we do things without involving clinicians. And I think a lot of that, it continues to hold over even now. But supply chain, what's so amazing about it is that we see everything, right? We, we see all of the purchase services. We see all of the widgets, all of the gadgets. And we have this amazing access to all the financial data as well as the clinical data. And like, if that's not consulting, right? I, I don't know what is. So we're, we're perfect for that. Right. Bringing the information forward to help make decisions for the patient, for the organization, and the health of both. So as we dive into contract labor spend, I want to define this. I just want you to say, this is what I'm really talking about today. Gotcha. So with contract labor spend, the first thing people think are travel nurses, but it's, it's much broader than that. So in any hospital, you can walk in and you will have a majority of the contract labor being clinical. So every level of nurse, but you're also going to see it in what are traditionally thought of as non-clinical but patient-facing roles. You're also going to see it in EVS, dietaries, any support service, your call center, supply chain, but it's very, very truncated. So they're typically not thought of holistically, right? When you say contract labor, it's, it again, it goes right back to travel nurses, which is, of course, the bulk of the spend in any facility. And obviously, top of mind, in the last two years, everybody's talking about the cost of travel nurses, how they went up to 3X, 4X from years prior. So, 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 Kat, let me ask you a question. So, there's, there's two points to this, right? You have the external piece and then you have the internal piece. It, it, it sometimes is a pendulum sh shift, but maybe talk about why supply chain outsources some of that and why have they avoided some of that contracted labor to outsource it maybe when they just keep pushing internally trying to hire these folks. So speak a little bit on that if you would, please. So supply chain has not traditionally ever been in the clinical contract labor piece. So traditionally, it's to totally normal to not see supply chain involved in picking a VMS or an IRP for a health system. So it's very normal not to see supply chain running a bid for what agency is a hospital going to use. So that, that has been isolated to nursing and supply chain, I think good, bad, or indifferent, views that as kind of a very territorial space for clinicians and has just voluntarily left that alone. Do you feel like we can utilize the SMEs, if you will, the subject matter experts in their particular area, whether it's clinical or non-clinical, and bring the master negotiators in to help support that, run parallel? Do you think that yeah. is a good solution? I'm hoping you're going to say yes. Yes, yes, <laughs> of course. Uh, absolutely. So it kind of goes back to that internal consultant role, right? So not only can supply chain act as an internal consultant, but also as that project manager, so to speak, for that clinical contract labor space, really for all the contract labor space. It, they are designed, so supply chain is designed 
following their value analysis, right, to say, hey, nurse leaders, we need to sit down and we need to know what exactly are you looking for in a travel nurse? Are you looking for at least two years of experience? Are you looking for XYZ certification? What is it that that you need, right? And let's nail that down. It's really no different than running any other value analysis project or task or initiative, right? Except we're dealing with people, right? We're dealing with a service, which again, dealing with a service sounds an awful lot like something that supply chain does anyway, right? It, it, this is just another purchase service. All right, let me zoom out just real fast on that point you made, which I thought was good. But if if supply chain is not negotiating those contracts now, in, in many cases they're not, sounds like, who is? And are they just showing up and people are signing off? Is it HR or who is it? So what, what we have seen, especially in the last couple of years for sure, is that there is very little negotiation on rates. It's more negotiation on how long is the contract, how long does the traveler have to work at the site before the site is allowed to try to recruit them to stay, because the those hourly rates are viewed as just kind of, quote, something we have to deal with right? They're viewed as a market standard, right? And with supply chain, supply chain by default is never going to say, oh, the first price that you've given me, that sounds of great. Course. Let me sign right. off on it, right? Yeah, give me less price, will you? I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, plus, exactly. Plus 10. <laughs> yeah, so it, it is a smorgasbord of people. So within single sites, we have found multiple people that are negotiating or rather not negotiating travel rates, who's getting picked, where is the job going to? So that's where you have hospital systems or even single site hospitals using two or three or five or 10 different travel agencies, right? Because they're treating it as like this big fire sale, right? We have to go, 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 or we're going to miss somebody and we're not going to be fully staffed. So, so, so Kat, we're talking about how that works. The starting process in my mind is we're trying to cut costs. You know, that's the initial piece. Obviously, there's the OPEX piece that kind of goes with this too. As we try to get that transparency to really in finance, say we have that, say that all that purchase services, and it sounds like it's a perfect scenario, which I've seen many times it isn't, and it's a sensitive area. A lot of people don't want to share that. What are some strategies to get that transparency and really be able to pull that true purchase services spend for a hospital and ASC for the entire system? How are, how are you getting to that as some of our listeners are trying to get it done without just walking right to the CFO's office saying, I need, I need all the purchase services yeah. spent. What are some best practices, please? Well, honestly, it's for supply chain to remember, and I'll, I'll probably keep saying this, is that supply chain is already doing this. They're just not doing it with contract labor. So if this was a syringe, what would I do? Okay, well, first I would go to my vendor and say, I need you to send me the data, the spend data for every single thing you have ever sold anyone in our system for this period of time. And I need it in XYZ format, right? And then I would go to AP and say, hey, I need for, you know, whether it's a, it's a loss of number or whatever the case may be, I need how many checks or POs we've cut to XYZ agency, right? Because you're going to trust, but verify just like you would in any other supply chain initiative. And then of course, you know, you want to go to those, I say end user decision makers, right? Because there can be a lot of space between those corporate supply chain folks and then the people at the site level. So a site level CFO might not actually know all the different places where labor is getting contracted from, but your nursing directors and managers might. So it, that goes back to, to all of the fun, lean things that we've been taught in the last couple of years. That's gimbal walks. That's go and see. That's interview some folks. Go hang out with them on the floor. You know, talk to them. And you're going to find a lot of things 
stuffed away in little corners that nobody ever knew about. Ken, as we think about this, you've got, uh, you're asking about negotiating, you know, terms, links, all these different things and, and, and price. But also, though, there's not that many companies that can do this service for this hospital at this day, this time, right? So it, doesn't it make it harder to negotiate those deals? In other words, do some, in some cases, those agencies or whoever we're talking about, they kind of have the upper hand in a sense, correct? They they have an upper hand in a sense as long as we don't know as much as them. So the more information that we gather, the more data points that we have, the more a site can go back or an IDN can go back to even a large nationwide agency and say, hey, here is what we want. And just like any other negotiation, even with like a a big medical device provider, you can say like, hey, this is what we want to pay. We don't want you to send us anybody that's over this rate. Plus, we want a revenue share. We know we're making you guys a ton of money, right? So there's a lot of, of things that are very much always on supply chain's radar. Things like revenue share, price points, all of that stuff that aren't necessarily on the radar of clinicians because their purview is to get qualified bodies in the door. Of course. That's a good idea. I like that. Okay. And, you know, you kind of said, like, they may not know the different staffing agencies that are being utilized, but that's also fluid when there's high demand, right? So all of a sudden, they're, like, adding the agency that says that they can deliver the staff. So it's constantly moving, like staying on top of it without data and transparency is like nearly impossible. What are some of the myths and misconceptions? You know, Gary asked a great question about why does supply chain avoid this in general, but then also what are some of these belief systems that sort of sustain that, continue to make that an issue? And, and how can we reshape people's thinking today that are listening to this from the supply chain audience that might open them up to, oh, yeah, maybe I should get into this? So I think on the supply chain side, we feel that we are not nurses, which is 99.9% true. <laughs> Right. We're not nurses. We've never been nurses. We've never worked in the clinical space. We don't understand their needs. We don't understand what it takes to fill a position. We don't know what it's like to ask somebody to work three or four twelves for weeks and weeks and weeks at a time. We don't know what it's like to try to manage a workspace where you have nurses at one pay level and travel nurses at a far greater pay level, but they're doing the same job, right? So that that can cause a lot of discontent and it has to be managed. So I think that that is very, very big in supply chain and that's, that's an immediate pullback, right? They're like, well, we don't know anything about this. That's not our lane. We're going to stay out of it. On the nursing side... I think it's pretty much the other side of that coin, right? You don't know what I need. You need to stay out of it. Every time you get involved in in something that that we're doing, we end up having, you know, products change that we don't want to get changed, you know, all of this kind of thing, right? And again, that harks back to this historic adversarial relationship. Whether it exists or not in that system, is almost not relevant, right? Because you'll still have a 20-year nurse who remembers the time 15 years ago that we changed the central line kit and basically made a bad decision and ruined everything. And there isn't right? like a single person <laughs> who's left from that decision on the team, right? Right, yeah. Like yeah. it's just art it's artifact of a, of a past situation that way. And you know, and and even the budgetary needs have changed since that experience. So I can hear the ambassadorship that you're talking about to really open that channel. And I think that goes back to, you know, being that internal consultant is how do you convey that message that you're not making blanket decisions and then going and getting the heavy to come in and execute that strategy that you're really trying to assist them in something that's very hard to get a handle on, right? Oh, yeah. 
And so yeah. what about the budgetary piece? Because if, yeah. if supply chain isn't necessarily doing the contract, where does the budget lie? And, and who stands to lose when the budget gets blown mm. out? And what do yeah. they lose? Great so question, Justin Poulin. Yeah, yeah. Nursing. Wow. To, whoa. <laughs> Holy I'm calling it. I always gave it up. I gave it up. That's a great question, JP. <laughs> really? I, mean, I, don't, I mean, really. <laughs> Off yeah. the chart. Yes. Wow. Well, Way to know, go. It's, it's kind of funny that, that you mentioned that. So a little little bit of a two-part two part answer. So the first part is nursing, nursing, nursing. It's nursing's money, nursing's budget, and nursing will lose. Right? Because... A healthcare system, and we've seen this over the last three years, this upcoming fiscal year is a little different. We can talk about that in just a second. But historically, healthcare systems do not budget to spend $200 million in the upcoming year in contract labor because they're betting that rates are going to go down. Nurses will, quote, come back to the bedside, unquote. And they won't have to have all this contract labor. And every year for the past three year, that has failed. That is leading to a lot of these huge negative margins because you're not meeting your budget, right? You're tanking it every time. So a lot and of- And you don't have a choice. Yeah, you don't have a choice. You have to have Right, it. if you don't predict that correctly and adjust your, your budgeting strategy- then you've already committed dollars to other areas, and this is one that you can't reel back on. It's not a cost center. And I, and I don't necessarily love watching cost centers' budgets get cut either, but when we hit this squeeze, that's where everybody goes looking, right? And so in this contracted labor, if you, if, if you want to be a good steward of, of the healthcare system's money and you don't want to keep pounding on the cost centers and leaning them out until all of a sudden it sabotages the revenue generating centers, because that's what happens, right? You you lean out cost centers to the point where you can't do revenue anymore because the support structure is not there. And you don't really see that until it's already had major consequences. If, if, if all of us, you know, you don't have that luxury in contracted labor spend. If you, all, if you go over the budget, you're going to keep going over the budget or that negative margin is still going to hit because you're not going to be able to keep pace with generating yeah. revenue. Well, and you have to remember too, like DRGs and things like that, they're not based off contract labor expense. They're based off just your standard nursing rates, right? So you you will literally never see the revenue ever match that it, that expense. It, it's just not going to happen. You, you know, Kat, I'm just going to expand on this as Justin brought it up, but the elephant in the room right now is contracted labor is going through the roof. I mean, it is the conversation piece every day. It's come up on power supply. It's come up, I'm sure, with Hayes and some of his interviewing on his side. But we're looking at this not at a yearly cycle. We're not looking at a quarterly cycle. It's like week to week to week and justifying the whole thing with the DRGs and the revenue and the ROI has become a bigger issue. Are, are you seeing that currently right now too as well? And what are some strategies you're diving into that just to be the transparency again, the kind of question? Well, what, and, and this will be kind of a, a little bit of a 30,000 foot answer, right? Is that healthcare systems have to really embrace that nurses love the concept in the idea behind being a travel nurse, right? So every hospital I've ever worked in has a float pool or they have flex staff, right? Well, a float pool is really just an internal agency, right? It's really kind of, that's really kind of the same thing. So hospitals have to really embrace that shift of trying to move these contract labor positions into employed flex staff, float pool staff, right? So they can fill their own needs and their own labor gaps with their own employed folks, right? Where supply chain can come in and help with that is the blessing of supply chain, again, because they're like an, an internal consultant, is that we are not so far into the fire that we can't see, right, how to, how to contain it and how to control it, right? Because a lot of times 
those corporate supply chain folks are not only physically removed from the hospital, right? They're in some corporate office somewhere, right? But we're not working 312s. I mean, most of us work like seven or eight twelves. <laughs> but, you know, so we're able to actually step back and say, okay, now just wait a second. You say you have a ton of contract labor. You don't want contract labor. No hospital wants any contract labor at all. You have to have them, right? So just because you don't want it doesn't mean that that need is ever going to go away, right? So how can we, how can we backfill that? You know, and supply chain doesn't know how to put in a triple lumen catheter. We don't know how to start IVs, but we sure know how to find people that can source them. We sure know how to find people that can make them. We sure know how to find folks that can offer fantastic products and services around those things. And we can do the same thing for contract labor. We can do the same thing for float pools, right? So we can, we might not know the answer as a department, right? As a function, but we can find it and we can find it while nursing is doing something that allows them to work up to their licensure. Hey, the reason that they need contracted labor is because they're already underwater with the staffing model. So if they're spending more and more administrative time managing schedules, trying to bring in staff, that's just one other person on the team that can't be involved in delivering clinical care. That's a great value prop once you earn that trust. Here's the other thing. I think another reason people have avoided the area is because of that dynamic between clinical and supply chain that has historically existed, as you described there. And it seems like it's a lot of work to, to build or rebuild those bridges in a lot of cases. So I gotta, I gotta use this saying, which I absolutely, by the way, I despise this saying, but I'm gonna use it anyway. Okay. But you, you say know. it about every other podcast. <laughs> I've never said this saying on the podcast before. <laughs> The Rolling you don't Stone, even know yeah, what there's to no say. moss. What is this? You don't what even is know this what to say. I'm waiting. <laughs> That's so funny. So uh, <laughs> here's the thing. Please tell our audience why the juice is worth the squeeze. Yes. Yes. Okay. Bam. So, <laughs> so it again. Um, the juice is worth the squeeze because you're talking about uh, let's say a 600 bed hospital on average is going to be spending a million dollars a month on contract labor. So if supply chain can save even 10% of that a month, that's over a million dollars a year. Bam. Just, the math, baby. just right there. And even if, even if it was half that, I mean, that's massive. So most yeah, it's still half a million. Chain, it's still half yeah. a million. And most supply chains, especially kind of like the larger system supply chains usually have a floor, right? They, they won't touch an initiative unless it saves $50,000 a year, right? Because then the juice isn't worth the squeeze. So with labor, quite frankly, without running any numbers, you can go ahead and buy that lottery ticket and win that you're going to save minimum high six digits. Minimum. Because you're bringing expertise to the table? Yes. Absolutely. That is yeah. lacking, just yep. just completely yeah. lacking from the yep. equation today. Yeah. Well, and what, what's interesting, um, and I, I've always felt this about supply chain, is we're the ones that put the puzzle together, right? All the pieces in the system are there, but we're the ones that know where to find them and go and put them together so you can finish your puzzle, right? Or the offensive line. I've heard that before. Or the offensive line. <laughs> that yeah, that, that saying over. has definitely come on a prior yeah, episode. Yes, it is. But all right, so Kat, if someone just dropped you in to Topeka to help Tommy with his spend. I would be thrilled. What is what is the low hanging fruit? What what would you the first thing you Where know do they he start? has he didn't have enough resources, he didn't have enough time. What what like one or two things that you could tell him, Tommy, right now that he could go back and go, Oh, that's a good idea. So the the first thing I would I would say is who approves requesting a contract nurse? Right? So who has the authority to do that? Is it your nurse manager who has their hair on fire? Is it their director who's got six departments, maybe eight cuz somebody left, right? Is it does it go so high as the CNO who's not going to have as quick of a turnaround time as needed? 
right? And then I would say, what is HR's role in that? So are they trying to hire a position at the same time that you've requested a contract labor nurse? Or is it linear? Do we try to hire a nurse for three or four or five months before we finally throw our hands up and say, okay, now we need to bring in a contract nurse? I would ask things like, what's your fill? What's your time to fill? Is it taking your, your agency 60, 70, 80 days to provide a quality person? Is it taking another 90 days to onboard them and get them in the door? So I would. I, I I would start data gathering immediately because that is the one thing that I find is totally lacking is that there is no one person in a hospital setting who knows every agency that's being used. There's no mm-hmm. one person who mm-hmm. seems to know who has signature authority. Is there even right? a technology for that that really ties it together? I mean, I realize you could look at like AP spend and things like that, but like, but it, and and I realize that if you're using one of those staffing solutions, you can log in there and kind of see what the deployments are. But is there like an ERP component that can plug in and tie this together from a strategy standpoint? Oh, oh, data, 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 yes data. Yes and no, yes and no. Here yes, we go, Kat. Yeah, yes, yes and yep. no. Yeah, so I think you know what's coming. So quite frankly, as soon as you pop out of the clinical space, like actual patient care, most hospitals have what I like to call dirty data. So they've got invoices that don't go through POs because they're hand signed by the CFO for a check request, right? Um, They've got uh, some nurses from some agencies that are using your clock in, clock out system and others that aren't, right? So the data that you have to pull from is quite frankly, as good as what you put in. So I know that's kind of a non-answer, but I, I think, frankly, it's a pretty common and truthful answer, which is why, again, with supply chain, we're used to dealing with all sorts of wild, janky data sets, yeah. <laughs> right? So I, I don't I don't want to say we necessarily enjoy it, but we're we're used to that, right? We're used to pulling everything together, finding that common denominator. And then right, I call it right setting, right? Right setting all of that data to figure out what in the heck's going on. You know, Kat, I, I think I agree with you 100%. I don't know if anybody could say, we have all captured purchase services contracts with the spend and we can hand it to you right now. I just don't think they can. It's just an ongoing and it changes. And you're talking about millions and millions and into the billions in spend somewhere in some of these larger systems. So I think one of the things too, I was going to ask you about this, but sometimes if we get a commodity or an area that we're really looking into and we say we pick apart, say we, say we got to the top 20 where we think our spend is purchase service and we identified the vendors. Sometimes we can go hit those vendors because vendors really know how much the systems are spending because really they have to report that, right? So that's another area, right? You found success there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Some folks in supply chain don't like to pull data from vendors because there's this kind of distrust, maybe not very good strategic relationships, right, between the system and the vendors, which is unfortunate. But it it doesn't negate the fact that that vendor probably has more sophisticated data systems, more sophisticated AR, and they're going to know exactly what they've invoiced us, exactly what we haven't paid, when we paid it, all of that stuff. So it's definitely a data set that I have always pulled when, when I've worked on supply chain initiatives, and I absolutely encourage anyone else to do the same. But a good vendor should partner and be willing to share that in a very transparent way. And that would be the lesson learned there. Yeah, for sure. All right, Kat, you did a good job. It didn't go an hour. You hit all the important topics and considerations. I think you'd laid out a very convincing case for why supply chain should get involved here and how they can approach the clinical side of the house as a resource that way so that they can focus on patient care. And what's interesting is, and we didn't really say this, but I'll, I'll kind of let you kind of close on this because this was a great interview. But because of the fact that they're typically focused on the supplies piece, 
this is really a diff- like an opportunity to represent that consultant position because I'm not taking away your products. I'm going to manage an, an enormous hassle for you, and I'm not asking you to necessarily change anything. I'm just asking you to let me bring my expertise to the table to make this better. I think it's a huge opportunity for supply chains to almost rebrand themselves as a partner to say, hey, CNOs, hey, CFOs, let me shoulder this burden with you. Let me help you carry this because right now you're just getting smoked with why do we have all this expense? How come you can't hire nurses? Like put it, put some of that on our shoulders and we can definitely provide support. Awesome, Kat. You killed it today. Okay. Great job. I know you said you were fun. nervous before this thing started. I didn't, <laughs> no, I didn't get any nervousness. Spoke well. You rocked it. You spoke really well. Good. Great analogies and metaphors. I can't help it. That's my jam. <laughs> he helped Hello. Tommy from Topeka, too. And that was Catherine Williams, supply chain expert. And Gary, we've talked a lot about contract labor spend and the concerns with the workforce shortage. But quite honestly, we've never had a conversation about encouraging supply chain to get involved. And I thought Kat made a very convincing argument today about why we should get involved and that it's just simply a gap. And I would say clinicians are already overwhelmed just trying to keep up with the demands of delivering patient care, that this is an area where this can really bridge some of the gap, not only in managing the finances of it, but in the collaboration. And as she said, especially with some of the historic clinical and supply chain tension that is sometimes there, what a great way to to try to alleviate that. No, game on, Justin. The gap is is there. We're already doing it, right? We're already gathering the spend. So why not allow supply chain to jump in and help take some of the stress out of the clinicians? Let them focus on mission and patient care, whether it's clinical or non-clinical. Let the SMEs, the subject matter experts, do what they need to do and let supply chain come in and do what we do best. We negotiate and we could support those contracts alongside. I thought CAT had great knowledge and great ideas to dive into it and pull that spend. But before we go, one more thing, Justin, I think you kicked Hayes and ours and myself on a two zero zero great questions. Probably the best question of the year. Probably the best question there. And I don't want to give credit where credit is due, but Hayes even said it and he was like, game on, right, Hayes? Well, I really wasn't I'll just be nice. <laughs> Oh my God! <laughs> I'll tell you this here. There he is. You said best question of the year, and we're. I just want to make sure because this episode's releasing in January. Oh, uh, I just want everybody to know we're recording in November, so I want to put that go. into context. All right. Well, that's going to do it for this episode. I've said it once. I'm going to say it again. Download the smartphone app for iPhone or Android. Just right now, open up your phone, go to Google Play or go to the App Store, search for Power Supply Media, download the app. It's the best way to listen to this show. You'll be able to search for different topics. We've got different categories of content like articles on the go, as well as these podcasts that you're listening to now. But if you really, really don't want to have another app, on your phone. I get it. You can find us on Amazon, Apple, or Google Podcasts. We're on Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and really any podcast application. There's so many out there. Just search for Power Supply Media. We do have bonus content, though, for some of the episodes like Susie Collins' back order process. You just got to, again, download that smartphone app to be able to access that. While you're there, we would love a rating and a review, whether you're liking and subscribing on one of those other podcast apps, or if you're downloading ours, we'd appreciate it. We'd also love to hear from you by email if you've listened to an episode and you've put something into practice, or maybe there was one that you thought was really good that really stood out. We want to hear about it. If you have ideas for guests, topics, or even maybe like a themed season that you think you'd like to hear from us, just go ahead and send that email to info at powersupplymedia.net. On behalf of Hayes, Gary, and myself, thanks for listening to this week's episode of Power Supply. Power Supply.